All right. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Met Plus training series. Uh, last week, we talked about, um, you know, just generally Met Plus, how to configure it, how to make the connection between Met Plus and, and Met. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about some of the commonly used um, controls within Met Plus, um, specifically looking at timing controls as well as um, the file name templates and, and trying to be able to uh, control how MetPlus looks for the files um, on your system. Uh, so we're gonna start off with um, uh, George uh, walking through um, some of the, um, the material that we have once again online in our user's guide. I'm gonna demonstrate um, doing some hands-on um, uh, sessions that we have added to support this um, training series. Uh, and then um, at the end of the session, I'm, I'm going to be asking um, a question. So I'm giving you the question ahead of time. You can think about it. Um, right now we are uh, theoretically scheduled to take a break um, next week uh, because of the, the um, American Meteorological Society meeting. There's, uh, I'm assuming that there's going to be at least a, a reasonable number of people that will want to be attending those um, sessions rather than um, this Met Plus session. So rather than having specific content um, presented uh, next week that people would miss, um, we were planning on taking a break. However, uh, a couple of uh, folks have uh, brought up the idea that maybe having a Q&A question and answer session might be um, worthwhile next week. So think about whether you um, would want to do that. If we do, we would gather the, um, the questions ahead of time, try and get a sense of which ones are the, the highest priority questions, and then um, you know start off with those questions. And, and um, if there's um, time left over, take some from um, you know, the, the participants and so forth. So at the end of the, the session today, uh, we will we'll be taking a raise your hand kind of poll. Um, for those of you who um, do not know how to use Google Meet to uh, to raise your hand. I'll review this at the end, but basically this is, I know that my screen's kind of small, but this right here is where you would raise your hand. So um, just think about it, whether you want to um, participate in a Q&A session next week. Um, so with that, uh, I think we're just gonna go ahead and jump right in. Uh, George, are you ready to start going over uh, timing controls? I am. Hi everyone, I'm George McCabe, um, and I'm going to talk about some of the co common configuration variables that are used in MetPlus to control time. Okay, is this text big enough for everyone to see? Oh, hasn't come up yet. Big enough for me, I don't know about for others. Okay, sounds good. Um, so in the MetPlus wrappers configuration, um, there's a set of variables that control the timing information. Uh, many of the MetPlus wrappers are designed to run multiple times, once for each runtime, and build commands based on that runtime. Um, so the First variable I'll talk about is the loop by variable. Um, and this determines if you're going to be looping over valid times or initialization times. Uh, so if the value for loop by is set to init or retro, then looping will be done relative to initialization time. If the value is set to valid or real time, then looping will be relative to the valid time. Uh, so we'll go through some examples here. Um, if you have loop by set to valid or real time, we are looping over valid time. Um, and you'll have to set four ver other variables. Uh, the valid time format, or FMT, uh, determines the format of the valid begin and end times that you will process. Uh, so here in this example, valid time format is set to percent capital Y, percent lowercase m, percent lowercase d, percent capital H. Um, this stands for year, month, day, and hour. So using this format, um, it, 
the configuration will expect your begin and end times to be set with that sort of time precision. Um, the, the directives here are um, Python string format directives, um, and, and many of those are supported uh, as it uses the Python uh, date time module to build these times. Um, the valid beg is the valid begin time. It's the first valid time that will be processed. Uh, and again, it needs to match the format specified in this valid time format. Uh, so here's another example. If the time format set to include year, month, and day, um, then the valid begin time must match that format and use this precision. So here, it will the first time we'll pro that we'll process is 2019 on February 1st. Uh, the valid end time is the last time that can be processed, and I'll emphasize can, and I'll explain that um, here shortly. Um, again, this this variable needs to match the time format. Um, so here in this example, uh, valid end time is set to February second, um, and so the next the next variable is the valid increment. This is the time interval to add to each runtime to determine the next time to process. Um, so the reason I say that the valid end time can be run but not won't will not necessarily be run is it really depends on your increment value. So say here if you have February 1st until February 2nd, but your valid increment time is set to two days, it will process February 1st, increment two days, and say, oh, this is past our valid end time, so we'll stop execution. So it won't, won't actually process February 2nd. Um, even though that's set as the valid end time. So it's good to be aware that all these set settings are set um, properly the way you want to to make sure that you process all the times that you need. Um, the valid increment value, um, by default, uh, the units are seconds, um, but you, there are some other time interval units that you can use to um, set in, in case you don't want to. Remember that a year is 86,400 seconds. Um, you can add these identifiers at the end of the time value, and it will um, compute the correct time. Um, so next, I'll talk about looping over initialization time. So if you have loop by set to init or loop by set to retro, um, then you need to set the following variables. These are all the same as the valid times, except they start with init underscore instead of valid underscore. Uh, but they behave in the, in the same way as the valid time variables. Um, so it's all the same rules apply here. Um, looping over forecast leads. So for each initialization or valid time that you'll be processing, you can define a, a sequence of forecast lead times to process for each of those times. Um, the variable that controls that is called lead seek or lead sequence. Um, and this is a list of comma separated list of times that will be processed for each valid or initialization time. Um, the default units for this are hours, uh, but again, you can specify the units if you need to um, say um, process minutes or um, or months or years. Um, let's see. Here. So, uh, in this example, we're processing three, six, and nine. These are hours again. So three hour lead, six hour lead, and nine hour lead. If you were looping over valid time and the current runtime is February 1st, um, 2019 at 0Z, then three times will be processed here. And you can see the valid time is the same for all of them. And the initialization time is adjusted based on these forecast leads. So three hours earlier or 21Z on the previous day six hours earlier or 18z on the previous day and nine hours earlier at 15z on the previous day if you are looping by initialization time uh, the same goes except the forecast leads will be added to the initialization time to compute the valid time so here in the same example you can see the initialization time is constant at 0z on the first and the valid times are uh, 3z 6c and 9z um, on, the, on that same day. Um, there is a special notation that you can use in the wrappers uh, config files to expand out a list of values. Um, and, the, and it can be used here in this lead sequence. Um, the notation is begin underscore end underscore 
uh, incur, which stands for increment, and then you specify the, um, each of those values. So the first time you want to, to use the last time, which is inclusive, and the increment between these. Um, so for example, here, if you use this notation and specify the start time, begin time is zero, end is 12, and interval is three, then it will be the equivalent of setting this list of 0, 3, 6, 9, and 12. Um, so this is useful if you have a really long list of forecast leads you need to process, and um, you don't want to have to list out all of those values explicitly. Um, this lead sequence um, is used similarly for uh, the series analysis wrapper if you're grouping by forecast leads. Um, I won't get into the details of that right now because that's a, sort of a special case. Um, here, the init sequence. Um, this was added because there are some cases where the user is looping by valid time and knows the interval of their initialization times. But um, if they are, say, processing once per hour, the forecast lead list that should be used for each of those valid times will differ per for each hour. Um, so for, exa for example, if you know that your um, init sequence is uh, zero hour, six hour, 12 hour, 18 hour, at zero Z, the forecast leads that you'd want to use are zero, six, 12, 18, and so on. Uh, but if your valid time is say one Z, then the list of forecast leads that correspond to those initialization times will differ and will be 1, 7, 13, and so on. Um, so you can use this if you need to be looping over valid time and, and generate a sort of dynamic list of forecast leads for each valid time. Um, if you're using this syntax, you'll also need to specify a min and max value, um, or else it will continue to go on uh, very far and, and try to um, use a very long list of forecast leads. Um, so you can restrict it here and tell it, I only want to use the leads that are between 12 and 24. Um, here again is this section I showed earlier, the time interval units uh, that shows the different um, valid notations that you can use to specify time if you don't want to use the default notation. Next here we have uh, time skipping. Um, so it's uh, often the case that users want to loop over many times but want to exclude certain times from their processing. Um, so this functionality allows you to skip times if needed. Um, the way this works is it is a, a list of items that are surrounded by quotation marks. And the format here is the time format directive notation followed by a colon and then a list of the times that correspond to that notation. So here in this example, we have months and three. So every third month, month or March will be skipped in this processing. Uh, this next example is um, listing days, and it has two days, the 30th and 31st. So it will skip every 30th and 31st day of, e of each month that's processed. This next example is a combination of the two. So you can use a comma separated list and define multiple different criteria to skip. So here it will skip the 30th and 31st of every month and the entire month of March. Um, again, this notation uh, for begin and end and increment can be used to define a list of times. So here, if you want to skip every even hour, you can specify the hours and then this list from 0 to 22 by 2. And so that will be the equivalent of skipping every, um, every even hour. Um, you can also use multiple directives here. So here we specify uh, an explicit year, month, day. And we skip these two explicit days, December 31st, 1999, and October 31st, 2014. Um, you can also configure the skipping to only um, execute the behavior for a specific tool. So here we're skipping these times for grid stat only. We're skipping the months 3 through 11. Um, and then for every other tool, we're skipping the 31st day. Um, keep in mind that the way the logic currently works, um, if you set an explicit skip rule for a given tool, 
the generic rules will not be applied. So if you also wanted to skip for good stat 31st day of each month, you would also need to include that in this list. It's not going to read the generic one as well. Um, Real-time looping. Um, to make things running, uh, to make things easier for users that want to run uh, based on their current clock time, we've added some nice notation that they can use to um, get the current clock time and use that in their configuration. So here, um, the, this, this is what we call a file name template tag, and the identifier in this tag is called now, and then we specify the format here, year, month, day, hour. So wh whatever time uh, is on your, your system's clock when you start execution, it will use that time and substitute the values here for your, for your end time. Um, there's also a shift keyword that is useful in this case. Um, this allows you to take the, the time that's, that's found and shift it by a number of seconds. Um, so here, you would, this example, you would set the valid begin time to the current year, month, day, hour, but you want to shift it by, uh, here is negative um, 86,400 seconds, which is one day. Um, so that will so that allows you to run for your current time and and run for say the previous day um, of of run times. The truncate keyword is useful here in, in real time processing. Um, if you um, aren't sure exactly which um, which hour you're going to be running, but you want it to sort of lock to certain times. Um, so here in this example. We want to process the 0z, 6z, 12z, and 18z for a given day, but we don't know if we're going to kick off execution at 6z. We may run at 7z or 8z, but we still want it to kind of lock to those intervals. Um, so you can use this truncate keyword and specify the number of seconds that we want to sort of lock to. So here, this, this is six hours in seconds, and this will make sure that even if you're running you know, an hour or two after 6Z, it will still process 6Z for you. Uh, okay, moving on to the process list. This variable defines the list of wrappers that you will run. Uh, it's a comma separated list, or you can include just a single value. So here in this example, we're just running the grid stat wrapper. And this example, we're running two tools, the PCP combined wrapper and the grid stat wrapper. Um, newly added in version 4.0.0 is the ability to specify an instance identifier for each item in the process list. Um, this allows you to run multiple instances of the same tool with different, different configurations, um, which was not possible to do in previous versions uh, very easily. Um, so here in this example, we have a process list with grid stat with no identifier, and then grid stat again with, followed by parentheses and some string. And this string is the instance identifier that will be used um, to pull other configuration variables. Um, so in general, if a tool is run without an instance name, it will use all the variables um, defined normally in the config section. Um, but if you specify an instance identifier and you create a section in your config file with the same name that matches this instance identifier, you can override certain values that were set in, in the config area and it will use those values instead. So in this example, this isn't the most useful um, application of this, but it's just to demonstrate the behavior. So here it'll run grid set twice using all the same configurations except for this instance will use this directory as the output directory, and this instance will use this directory to write, the, write its output. Um, so again, not a great use of this functionality, but here to demonstrate that you can um, configure the same tool in different ways and, and set any number of variables uh, differently based on these two instances. Uh, the loop order determines, um, I, I like to think of it as the outer loop that's processed. So um, loop, you can loop over times or processes. 
So looping over times, think of it as the outer loop will be times and the inner loop will be processes. So for each runtime, it will loop over each process, then increment to the next runtime, loop over all the processes, and then increment to the next time again. So in this case here, looping by times, processing PCP combined and grid stat for these three runtimes, the first, second, and third, um, it will run in the following order. So it'll run PCP combine, then grid stat for the first. Then it will go to the next time and run PCP combine and grid stat for the second, and then go to the next time and run PCP combine and grid stat. Um, the other option is processes. So think of it as the outer loop is processes. So for each process in the process list, it will loop through all of the runtimes and process those, and then go to the next process and process each time for that. So here we'll run PCB combined three times, one for each time, and then grid stat for these three times. Um, so I'd like to note too, there are some tools such as series analysis or stat analysis um, that don't loop over all of these times. It, sort of is designed to have you process a lot of data and then sort of run an analysis over a range of times. Um, so if you're using one of these tools, uh, you must have this loop order set to processes or it will error out. And um, th the reason is you don't want to run grid stat once and then run an analysis over the one file and then run grid stat again and run your analysis over two files. It doesn't really make sense um, logically. So it will stop you and tell you that you cannot configure it that way. Um, the last thing I'll talk about here before we go to the hands-on is the custom looping functionality. Um, so you are able to define for each wrapper a list of strings that can be substituted for each run. So for each runtime that you're processing, it will loop over this list of strings and you can use that string to substitute values into um, your templates, which we'll get into a little more detail coming up. Um, this was added a, a little while ago, and it, it's useful if you have one small thing that's different between your different runs. Uh, say if you're processing a list of ensemble members that are named in a certain way, um, you can set it up to run PCB combine on each of those ensemble members and define the, the directory that you're going to read from um, like that. Um, typically, it, for more advanced cases where you need to run a tool multiple times, the instance capabilities and the process list is really a better way to go as you can change multiple variables and change a lot of different settings for each of those instances. Uh, but if there's only one sort of string keyword that you need to change from run to run, then this custom loop list can, could, could be useful in that case. Um, so we'll now switch over to Tara, who will go through um, some newly added sections of our online tutorial to um, sort of demonstrate how to use some of these timing control vari variables and see how changes in that config file will affect your runs. Well, actually, yeah. Hey, George. I was hoping you could answer. Um, ben Green asked, um, what would happen if you were to configure the times to begin on January 31st, end on December 31st, and loop by one month? Um, good question. Um, so we do support month looping in, um, in the wrappers. And so what, okay, hmm. that's a good question. Um, I am not exactly sure the answer to that. You know, um, in the tutorial, we're gonna in the exercises that Tara's gonna go over. I think you're gonna have an opportunity to play around with it. So Ben, maybe you can figure it out and let us know at the end of this hour what happened. My my guess, which is just a guess at this point, would it would run the last date of each month. Um, so if there's not 31 days, obviously it would process that, but I'm, I'm honestly not exactly sure how that would behave. That's, that's a great question. Okay, and then uh, an, an additional question from Benu um, is, will setting process as loop order always um, be a better choice? Um, 
So I would I would say yes is my opinion. Um, we've actually had some discussions of removing this option as it can be a little confusing and limiting. Um, and so I, I I typically would prefer to run by processes as opposed to time. Um, I think the the reason we initially allowed users to loop over uh, the times first is they could if they have many runtimes they're processing they can sort of get final output from their run um, sooner and be able to sort of look at that output while the rest is running but really i th i think a better way to to handle that would be to configure your um your use case to process one time run it evaluate the output and make sure that it looks the way that you do before setting a long list of runtimes to process yeah, so, and, and um, thank you for bringing that up, George, and, and um, for asking the question, Binu. I, um, this is actually a great opportunity for us to ask those in the community that are part of this training series. If you um, can, uh, you know, if, if you feel that you can come up with a, um, an example, a scenario um, where uh, looping by time versus looping by process is um, important and critical, then um, go ahead and, and let us know. Um, you can uh, add in um, the information. Uh, it looks like George is, is um, bringing up the issue right now. You could add it directly into the issue, or you could, um, there's a, a discussion. I think there's a discussion um, out there also for people to contribute to, which we can um, put in the, the chat as well. So. Yeah, so um, I just put the discussion topic in the chat. Uh, so this is sort of soliciting feedback of basically would anybody miss this option um, and sort of some justification on why we think it would be useful to remove it. Um, so removing this option, what it would al always behave in this sort of loop order equals processes. Um, but of course, if, if somebody is, you know, expecting to have the option to loop by times and they would miss that behavior, we don't want to limit people's experience we want to make it better um, and so if you use that um, that sort of logic and and you would miss it then please put a comment here um, noting that um, but some of these changes i think would would allow um, some of these tools to be a little more expandable um, you could set different run times for different tools and um, there, there's some other benefits in simplifying the logic but again, we don't want to limit your experience. We want to enhance it. Okay. Um, so I think we'll move on uh, just so that we can stay on time. So I'm going to um, start into the hands-on training here. Uh, I'm providing the link to, um, to the training. But I also wanted to just refresh your memory as to where you can find this. So... Uh, Okay, there we go. Um, so if you go to the, the training series to the agenda, and if you scroll down, we're uh, currently in session six. And if you open up the agenda, you can see that, um, you know, we just uh, went over the timing control. Now we're going to go to modifying example.conf for timing control. So we're just going to use the, the shell example. Um, uh, uh, at this point in order to demonstrate what we're doing. Um, as a refresher, uh, you'll notice over here, once again, we have Met Plus set up. And, um, you know, the, one, of, one of the things that you always want to do when you're coming back in to get started with the um, tutorial is to go ahead and, and um, verify that your environment is set up correctly, which for the most part is, is uh, you know, changing directory to where you're running your tutorial and then um, sourcing the, um, the tutorial uh, script that uh, um, is set up to, um, to make sure that, you know, uh, your paths are, are set up properly and so forth. So I went ahead and did that. I'm going to kind of have more screen for uh, the X term versus the online tutorial. Um, just to, to let you know, what I'm doing is I'm running on a Windows machine using MOBA X term, and then I've um, actually SSH'd into one of our um, internal computers, um, a Linux server. So that's um, that's the setup that I'm using, um, and that you know truly is different than for other people. But 
just showing you that you can use Windows and use MOVA Xterm and, um, and do a lot of work that way as well. Okay, so now that we've set up our environment correctly, um, and unfortunately I lost for a second here. There we go. Um, you know, we, we've already run through, um, you know, how to set up for all the different um, supported platforms. Um, and and um, we got um, during one of our previous sessions to how to run with, um, you know, how to run Net Plus. I've expanded that name to be how to run Net Plus with example.com. Um, and just to make it easier to, to know where you are in, in the, um, the, uh, um, the menu, um, the next one is uh, modifying timing control in exam example.com. So that's what we're using now. So we're, uh, I'm already uh, in um, the correct uh, directory where I, I want to work. I'm going to go ahead and, and copy um, the example.conf into our um, user config area that we've been using for the online tutorial and then rename it to be example time underscore timing.com so that you have an example of how to, to you know, um, modify the, the timing.com. And I'm going to go ahead and paste that in. And um, then we're going to go ahead and just uh, edit it. And once again, I'm going to just kind of slide this over to here so that we can see a little bit more clearly. So you'll notice that um, if, you, if you've seen this before, that um, it's a fairly stripped down um, configuration file. Um, however, uh, there are, um, you know, uh, some of the, the key pieces that we're looking for here. Um, so uh, what, we're, what we want to do is we want to just start playing around with how to control, um, you know, the timing format and so forth. So um, in 3A here, um, it says uh, go ahead and, and uh, modify um, valid begin and valid end, um, which are set here um, to be um, back in 2017. Why don't we go for something that's a little bit more current, like today, um, a few hours ago, so 2022, uh, 0118 at 9 UTC. And um, just to, to make it as simple as possible, we're, we're going to um, just only have it look at one time. 0118, 09. So we, we went ahead and changed those. Um, and same thing, rather than um, looking at uh, you know, a lot of different lead times at this point. Let's just look at, at a very simple example. Um, so we already have valid increments set to only one increment, but why don't we go ahead and, and um, modify the lead sequence to only be for um, one lead time as well. And then let me scroll down a little bit. And then if you look over here in the examples 3C, um, we, we do have in this example how you can set up, um, you know, some of your custom looping, um, which uh, uh, George just went over. Um, the examples that we have uh, on, in the command line, or excuse me, in the, the um, X term, um, are uh, EXT, which stands for generic extension, which you would never necessarily see on a file, but it, it was originally set up just to be you know, kind of generic, and then, um, you know, an example of running with NetCDF NC. Why don't we just go ahead and, and um, once again, take it down to just one loop. Um, so we'll just leave it as EXT for right now. So um, that's there. So now you should see, um, we, we expect to see this um, run for only one um, forecast lead time. Um, and, uh, and so why don't we see what happens after we exit editing the conf. Go ahead and paste it. We're going to run netplus.py um, using examplatiming.conf and then um, you know, pass in our tutorial configuration settings in the tutorial.conf. And you can see here all the logging information. The critical you know, information that, that comes out of it is it shows you what um, valid time it's running at. Um, you know, it will give you a sense of, of you know, where it's looking for the data um, and you know, the in input template that it's looking for and so forth. Um, and what you'll notice is that it did run for only a single time. 
It says info processing format at uh, three hour lead time, which is right here. I'm giving you um, wh when it was initialized at and you know um, what it was va the valid time for. So that's a very basic example. So why don't we go ahead and, and make it a little bit more complicated. Um, so we're just going to go back and we're going to um, edit. Uh, I use the up key up arrow um, in order to bring up the, the BI um, requirement again. Um, and uh, we want to change from um, the, the valid increment so that we, we look at a little bit more data because, um, you know, we just wanted to see how to expand that. So basically now we're going to change the valid end and valid increment. So we're going to go from um, the 18th at 9 UTC to the 18th at 15 UTC. And um, and possibly, you know, why don't we increase the, the increment of, of um, valid times as well. So coming over here, we're not going to touch valid begin. We're going to just um, touch valid, valid end. And we're going to instead look at um, you know, uh, files that are, are generated every three hours or that are um, valid every three hours. And we're going to, I'm going to clear the screen so you can see it more clearly. Um, we're going to basically run the same command. And this time you'll see that it, it ran um, at three different valid times, valid at 18, uh, on the 18th at 9 UTC, 18th at 12 UTC, and 18th at 15 UTC. You'll also see that it, um, because it's, um, you know, moving through the, um, uh, because we're running in valid time, that it, in order to keep it constant at a three hour lead time, then the um, initialization um, is also changing. So for, uh, something valid at 9 UTC. Um, it's looking at the it's looking at the run that um, was performed at 6 um, UTC or 6 C and so forth. Um, for 12 UTC, it's um, you know at 9 Z and um, 12 excuse me 15 UTC. It's um, looking at the the 12 Z initialization. So okay, so then why don't we go ahead and and just um, flip it around a little bit. And then once again, just arrow up to get to VIing things. Um, and this time, instead of running by valid time, we want to loop by um, initialization time. And so to do that, first thing, as George pointed out, is you change the loop by um, to init. And then um, similarly, you also have to change anything else that references init. Um, like init time format, init begin, make sure you type it in properly, um, init end, and init um, increment. If you don't do this, you will get, um, it, it'll error out, and it will tell you that it can't find those, um, those configuration options. So um, pretty much I just um, went through um, 8A, B, C and D here, just changing everything from valid to init and E. And so um, once again, I'm going to clear it so you can actually see what pops up. And we're going to run the same configuration with the same command again. And this time, um, you can see that it's running at different initialization times at 9, 12, and 15. And if you go and look at, um, you know, the information about what it's processing, um, it's looking at the 9Z initialization valid at 12Z, rather than you know, looking at something that was valid at 9Z, now it's looking at something that was initialized at, at 9Z, and, and so it's looking forward. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, 12Z valid at 15Z, and um, 15Z initialized valid at, at 18Z. Okay, so finally, I um, just wanted to demonstrate this because as um, George also mentioned, in order to run, um, you know, uh, some people have um, different terms in their head. So um, some people might think of turning, um, running something in terms of uh, retrospective mode or in a real-time mode. So um, running it uh, with an initialization held constant is equivalent to running retrospective. And so if we just go in and, and modify the file one more time, 
time she comes back. Hold on. Come on. There we go. Sorry, I had to typo in there. Um, and instead of running by init, we change this to retro, which once again you'll see here um, is actually called out. Init or retro is the same. Ballot or real time is the same. Sorry, let me do that again without typing in extra characters. And we're going to go ahead and clear and just run the, the same commands. Um, once again, I'm just using arrow up to get to that. You'll notice that it's exactly the same time. Init time at 9, init time at 12, init time at, at 15. So, OK. Um, that ends this part of the, the um, hands-on demonstration. Do we have any really quick questions, or shall we switch back over to George um, talking about um, file naming conventions? I'm going to go ahead and stop presenting. Did any questions come in? I have a quick question, if I can. Sure. Um, so why, what, what would have happened if you didn't change ext nc to just ext? Oh, okay. Uh, there we go. Or, or in, other, you know, in other words, why, why did we do that? I just, um, just to decrease the number of looping, the amount of looping for this example. So here, um, let's go ahead and, and instead say, is ext to me means nothing. So instead let's, uh, let's do nc and uh, grb or something like that for grim. And if we were to, and run the same thing. Now you'll notice that it um, it actually loops over many more instances. So, and in this case, what it's doing is it's looking for um, you know uh, both files that end in um, netcdf here and files that end in grib. I see. Okay, so you have you could in this case you do, and in, in other cases you might have. The same exact file just in different file formats and you don't need to process it more you probably just want to pick the one you want to work with right yeah yeah okay but it, it does uh, um, demonstrate that that you can have this customization in this case we use file format but there's other you know things um that uh, uh george went over if you go to the the online user's guide you know it'll, it'll describe a few other ways of, of doing that but okay Okay, so in the interest of, of time, I think we're going to go ahead and, and switch back over to um, George going through file name templates. Okay, thank you, Tara. So here is a section, uh, continuing the section that we were looking at earlier under the chat system configuration chapter. Um, this is now directory and file name template info. Um, so the MetPlus wrappers use uh, these configuration variables to um, help you find the files that you need to use for a given run. Um, so you control the timing with the timing variables, and then for each runtime, you can use these what we call file name template tags to find the correct file that you need to use for your run. Um, so here, um, we'll demonstrate this with a few different examples. Um, so here, using templates to find observation data, uh, you can specify the input directory. That's the path that all your files will file be found under. Uh, this is sort of the kind of constant um, path that will not change from run to run. Um, and then relative to that directory is a corresponding template um, variable that uses these file name template tags. So in this example, there's this tag, um, it has an identifier and a format directive. Um, there may be other directives as well, but uh, this one just has format. So this is using the valid time and the format is year, month, and day. Um, and then you can see here we have a slash. So this is a directory and then some constant text. 
and then another template tag that uses the valid time, uh, this time with year, month, day, and hour, and then some extension at the end. Um, so what this does is for a given runtime, it will compute the valid time, um, either from what you're looping or computed from the initialization time and the forecast lead. And it will substitute the values for that given valid time in here and use this to find the files that you need to process. Um, one quick note, um, so in previous versions of the MetPlus wrappers, there were different sections that contained these variables. So the uh, directory was found under a section called DIR or DIR, and the templates were all found under a section called file name templates. Um, we have since kind of consolidated those into one config section um, because we realized it was uh, we weren't getting the benefit that we were hoping from having these different sections, and this allows you to put these two corresponding variables right next to each other. Um, I can show a quick example. Um, so some of the, the configuration files have not been updated yet. Some have. Um, so this is an example of the grid stat wrapper. It has this config section, and then all the way down here at the bottom, we have a directory section that has the directory variables, and then down here, the file name template section with all the templates. Um, and we realize it's, it's, it, can be, it can be a little confusing uh, to have to kind of jump around and say, okay, here's my grid stat forecast template template, and here's the corresponding directory way up here. Um, so we've since sort of consolidated that and allow you to put those two kind of right next to each other, and it makes it a lot easier to see how these sort of work together. Um, so back to here, um, if you're running at a val with a valid time of February 1st, 2019 at 12Z, um, then the, the path that will be substituted here uh, contains all these valid time values. And you can see there's a subdirectory with the year, month, day, and then the year, month, day, hour substituted into the file name. Um, note that you cannot use any of the file name template tags in the dir directory section uh, variable, sorry. Um, and I will get into um, a little bit of detail of why that is coming up. Um, and I'll, I'll, I will also note that if you don't want to use this directory variable and you want to put your full path in the template, that's totally fine as well. Um, but there are some cases where you will need to separate this out. Uh, most of the time, it's really just for uh, ease of readability. It's easy to see these two on two separate lines instead of having a big long template path that wraps around. Um, so init and valid are keywords to use initialization and valid times, but there are a few other keywords that are supported, uh, including lead, offset, um, DA is data assimilation init time and cycle. Um, so using templates to find forecast data, um, typically, forecast files are named, including the initialization time and forecast lead. Um, and so here, this example uses that. So we have some sort of prefix, and then an init tag that has the year, month, day, and hour, followed by some constant text, an underscore, and an F, and then this lead template tag. Um, for variables like lead, um, you can specify the format. You can also add the precision that you want to include. Um, so in this case, all of your um, all of the file names have three digits for the forecast lead that are padded with zeros. And so setting percent three h here will force it to use three digits, even if there's only one digit in the value. Um, so here you can see, the init time is substituted, and this three-digit forecast lead is also substituted. Um, you can, for some of the wrappers, we support um, the format for some data assimilation data. Um, this example here is PBDNC. You can specify a list of offsets that will be tried to um, to see if it can find the files. If it finds the first one, it will use that. If not, it will move on to the next and try that. Um, so here you can use this DA init cycle and offset variables, or sorry, template tags, and it will sort substitute the appropriate values in there to find the files that you need for that format. 
um, shifting, as I mentioned before, talking about the real-time variables, um, can also be use, useful in these other file name templates. Um, here's an example if you, you have uh, the year, month, day, but you want to shift it by one hour or negative 3,600 seconds, um, you, you can do that. Um, this example came from a, a real example that we, uh, that we saw where the data uh, had files that, had, uh, that were named with year, month, and day, but the data inside those files contain data from zero, uh, 1z on that day until 1z on the following day. Um, so for example, if you're running at 0z, you actually want to use the data from the, pre the, the file from the previous day. Um, but if from 1z on, you want to use the, the data from that current uh, day. So here, this template allows you to do that. So if you're running at 0z, it will shift your year, month, day by an hour and use the previous day. But if you're running at 1z or 2z or 3z, this shift will still give you the same year, month, day, and it will use that current day's data. Um, this next example is using file windows to find valid files. Um, so this is the case where you will need to use the input directory. Um, how this logic works, uh, so this logic is used if, um, if you have files that are named not with the exact valid time they are using, but it may vary by you know a certain number of seconds or minutes, um, this allows you to define a window around your valid time, and the logic will go into this directory, look for all of the files in there, and use this template to extract the time information out of each of those files to see if it matches the format and to see if it falls within this window of time that you've specified. Um, the default here is seconds, so this is a two-hour window around the um, valid time. Um, so I won't go into all the details here, but this example sort of lists out if you have a given runtime and these are the files that are found in the, the directory, um, it'll step you through the process of how it checks each of these times and which file it, it ultimately decides to use. Um, so that's, if you're interested in using that sort of logic, I would recommend reading through th this in detail. Um, but uh, I will note, so, so some tools only allow one input file, and if that is the case, then it will use the closest time to the, the valid time. Um, but some other tools allow you to process more than one file, and if that's the case, it will find all the files that fit the criteria and read all of those files in. Um, you can also specify these windows um, differently based on the tool you're using. Um, so you can have a sort of generic file window begin and end time uh, that will be used for all observation data here. Um, you can also specify, um, so for grid stat, you can say, I want my begin time to be negative 1800 seconds. I want my end time to be positive 1800 seconds. And it will use that window for grid stat only. Um, and then here in this example, for ensemble stat, we've only specified the end time, not the begin time. Um, so we will use the sort of generic begin time and the end time that we specified here. Um, okay, I can, I'll touch on this runtime frequency logic. Um, this only applies to a few of the tools and is uh, sort of new functionality, but I, it'll be good to uh, to briefly talk about this. Um, so some of these tools um, you'll want to process um, at a different intervals of, of time. Um, some, some tools you want to run it once and process all of the times that are there. Um, sometimes you'll want to run it, you know, once, say, once per initialization or valid time. Um, and so these tools allow you to sort of specify that frequency to use. Um, so these are the different settings that you can set for these runtime frequencies. Uh, you can tell it to run once, which will process all files. Uh, once per init or valid, so if you're looping by init, it will run once for each initialization time using all forecast leads. If you're looping by valid, it will run once per valid time using all of the leads. Um, you can also set it to run once per lead, so it will 
get all the files that match a certain forecast lead. Um, and finally, you can set it to run once for each runtime. This sort of mimics the behavior of most of the other tools that are run once per runtime. Um, so here in this quick example, uh, we have series analysis, and we have a range of times and forecast leads, and we have our file name templates and directory. Um, and what this will do is it will go through all the times in your in your that you've specified in your looping using this template, and it'll find all of the files that sort of match that. So here in this example, we find six files. Um, if you've configured it to run once for series analysis, then it will use all six of these files to do your analysis. If you've set it to run once per, per initialization time, then it will group these and run once for each initialization time. So here's 12Z, all the forecast leads, um, or sorry, the 17th at 12Z, all of the forecast leads, the 18th, all of the forecast leads, and the 19th. Um, if you were to configure it to run once per forecast lead, it will group all of the three-hour forecast leads and run for that, and then run again for all of the six-hour forecast leads. Uh, running once for each will run once for each initialization and um, lead time, um, and it'll process six different separate runs. Um, this isn't really a, a useful application of series analysis, as it's not very useful to process one time in your analysis, uh, but it just sort of demonstrates how the logic works. Um, there is a wrapper called user script wrapper, which allows you to define your own script to call um, at different intervals. Um, and so uh, that tool would be a useful application to have it run once for each runtime and handle that data as, as you prefer. Um, the logic also builds a list of all of the files that are valid for that given runtime that you can reference in your script. So you can get the list of all the files that match that time and, and use it how you need to in your script. Um, these are sort of more advanced cases, um, but it's good to kind of let you know that it's, it's available and how that sort of works briefly. Um, but um, most use cases likely will not use that uh, um, more advanced functionality. Um, so now I will switch back to Tara again, and she and we'll go through some online tutorial demonstrations to um, change some of the file name template tags and see how that affects your runs. Okay, thanks, George. Um, we are actually at the top of the hour. I really want to um, get a sense of, of how many people would want to do a um, FAQ session tomorrow or next week. So. Um, let's do that really quick, and then we will go ahead and, and um, spend like five minutes going through the, the hands-on. So FAQs, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, you know. Okay. Looks like there's um, plenty, so we'll go ahead and, and um, figure out a, a way to have an FAQ session that allows people to put questions in and, and um, possibly even like vote up the, the questions so that you, um, we answer the most commonly used ones. Um, so if you if you can stay online, um, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and, and um, spend five minutes running through um, our next hands-on so that it's included in the recording. If you can't stay online, go ahead and, and access the recording um, you know, after we get it posted. So thanks so much. Let me go ahead and present. Um, Kara, really quickly, I saw Perry asked a very good question. Um, okay, go ahead. I and to explain. Okay, um, so Perry asked if um, I, I mentioned these different sections for the directory and file name templates um, are now all under config. Um, you do not need to change your existing config files. There's logic in there to um, go through the list of the sort of previously defined sections and pull all those values in and put them in the config section for you. So no updates are needed to your old config files. Um, it sort of does that behind the scenes for you. All right, so I went ahead and, and put the, um, the link to the next section, um, which is the file name template, um, running that using example.com. It is um, right after the um, time and control um, example. And um, so you can see that right here. Um, we just we had gone through time and control. Now we're looking at file name template. Um, and I, I just wanted to actually start off with 
um, you know, thinking about a, an actual file that um, we might be interested in. So looking at some of our sample data, I just kind of went around and, um, you know, and, and did a, a listing of um, our sample data. So I, I um, provide that here. Um, and if we look in, um, you know, the directory for some of the forecast sample data, you'll see that there's um, a file from NAM. Um, it's in group format, and it's got a fairly complex naming structure. So um, the first thing I wanted people to think about is, you know, what, what's going to stay constant and what's going to change routinely? So what's in bold is, you know, likely going to remain constant. Um, and then things that are going to change routinely are possibly like the, um, you know, the, the timing information, um, even possibly the name of this grid and so forth, but that's um, a little bit more complicated. So if you think about just timing information, you have um, what's held constant and what's changing, um, and uh, that would convert into this particular um, example of, um, you know, how to handle some of the, the file naming template. So we're going to go ahead and, and work with that for this um, tutorial, for this example. Um, starting from uh, the timing um, configuration file that we were already running with, let's go ahead and, and just copy that and make it, um, uh, rename it to be uh, for file names so that we can kind of keep track of, of what, um, what we're doing with um, file naming convention. So I went ahead and copied it. And then I'm going to just go ahead and, and, and edit it. And um, if you scroll down to the bottom, um, this is uh, many times where the, the um, templates are for file names and so forth. You'll notice that there's this example input, input directory and example um, input template um, listed. In the interest of time, um, I went ahead and already edited um, the file um, because, you know, that way it's just ready to go. Um, excuse me. Uh, so in this case, um, for uh, section four here, we want to change the input uh, example input directory to be um, pointing to our input base directory um, and then, you know, the, the path to that. Um, and uh, you may wonder where input base, base comes from. I originally had to think about that as well. And then I remembered that when we call metplus.py, we're not only passing in our configuration file, but we're also passing in the tutorial.com that um, specifies some of the, the routine um, paths that, that we might be using. Um, so uh, if you go in and look at um, tutorial.com, you'll notice that input base is, is um, identified there. And what it's doing is it's um, passing in an environment uh, variable, um, in the metplus data um, environment that was set up when we were originally setting up the tutorial. So that's where that came from. Um, so I went ahead and typed in input base um, and then the, the path to um, uh, where the, the data should be. Um, as well as um, the other part of it is updating the um, input template to be had identified up here as the template for our one file. So that's um, listed right here. I'm going to go ahead and exit out of that. Uh oh, I just lost everything. Um, now I'm going to have to type really quick. Because unfortunately, going between mobile X term and, um, and Windows does not go as seamlessly as what you would like. And now I can't type very well. Um, T, parentheses, um, init, question mark, FMT equal dollar sign to H, curly dot T, a whip, 1236.tm00. Curly, net question mark, FMT equal 
percent year, percent month, percent day, really back at that grid. And I missed a percent. I did dollar sign instead of percents. Okay, so um, we've gone ahead and, and edited that. And now let's go ahead and run. I forgot to um, update the, the base directory, but let's go ahead and run anyways. See what happens when you get out of sync? Makes it hard. Okay, so um, you'll notice here that um, what it found was uh, uh, processing um, input, and it says um, info looking for input directory in, in, in um, input directory for file name, and it gives us this file name. And it looks like it pretty much has the same structure as what we're looking for, but you'll notice it's not for um, the right uh, date and and um, month year, month, day, and time. So we still have some um, editing to do, which is identified in eight here. So we're going to go back in and edit. And what we want to do is we'll, we want to just set the um, init begin and end um, for that, just that one file, which is in 2007, um, March 30th, at 0z. Zero seven, zero three thirty zero z, and I'm gonna sweep back down here and, and get our directory um, sorted out as well. Which I'm looking for input base. That that test data sample. Forecast. Okay, so we've gone ahead and, and we've modified our um, init begin and end as per what's specified in 8a. And now we're just going to exit out of the, the directory and we're going to run the um, same command. I'm going to clear it so we can actually see what happens. I'm going to run the same command. And here now you can see that it did actually um, look for the, the correct file. Um, if you look at the, um, the input directory, you can see that it's looking in the correct place for the input directory. Um, and it's also looking at um, for the, the correct file name. So that's uh, just a really quick example. Um, and then uh, uh, we, we um, actually set up a, um, a more advanced example um, that is going to be homework for um, at the end of the session. So um, if you go to the end of the practical session one, which um, this is we're actually finally completing the end of practical session one. We've already run through exercises 1.1, one, um, 1.2, 1, 1. and 1.3. But if you come here to um, exercise 1.4, um, what we do is we give you a, um, a set of file paths and then just ask you to go ahead and, and um, go in and, and modify um, the configuration file and see if you can figure out how to do that yourself. And then the answers um, you can find at the end of the session. So with that, thank you for your attention. Sorry we ran 10 minutes over. And uh, hopefully um, this gives you at least a, a little bit of an example of how to run with NetPlus, including the, the file name template. Do we have any um, last questions? There's uh, one question about uh, the .grb extension versus .grib. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and I think that was just a typo in the example. No, um, there's there's times where um, uh, depending on the organization, they will use grib. Um, and uh, did I type something in, incorrectly? If I did, I'm sorry. Um, but sometimes uh, GRIB1 are, is called that GRIB, um, sometimes it's called GRB, GRIB2 sometimes it's called GRB, and sometimes GRB2. 
Um, so it really depends on the naming convention coming from the organization. And that's part of the reason why we gave so much flexibility in being able to define these naming templates. Okay, so I, I typed in correctly. Sorry about that. All right, um, any, any last questions? Excellent. So um, it looked like we had enough people um, interested in FAQ session next week. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And uh, so uh, I'll update you with how to submit your questions um, in our weekly email that goes out when um, I send out email about the recording. Thank you so much for attending.